Uh, hi, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, um, or whenever you're receiving this. Uh, this is uh, Peter Gratton uh, presenting uh, today uh, Chapter 7.1. Uh, now, Chapter 7.1 builds a lot on, in fact, on chapters, and I'll go through the PowerPoint slides, uh, on chapters, um, uh, Chapter 6.6. 6. And this uses the rules of uh, what are called rules of implication. And so, like indirect truth tables, what we're going to be doing is moving back. We're there. We move backwards from invalidity. Here, we're not going to use truth tables at all, but we're going to actually use uh, re high reasoning and the logic we've learned that is valid to show that a conclusion is true. And so, um, I highly recommend the other YouTube video that I provide uh, with the course, but I feel like I should always give my own lectures as well, uh, because I think he does a good job there of reviewing previous material and uh, also um, uh, then sh um, he does a good job of going over previous material, but also um, going step by step and giving other examples of how to understand the material. And I think that's best uh, for any student is to see at least um, uh, a couple of different ways into uh, the material. Okay? Um, so these are, uh, we have to understand first what are rules of implication and then what natural deduction is. So since um, the informal fallacies of chapter three, uh, in chapter six and seven, uh, we have been looking to prove uh, uh, invalidity. That is, we use Venn diagrams, we use um, direct or long truth tables, and then we use indirect truth tables to show if an argument is invalid. But here, we're learning how to do proper, that is, valid forms of reasoning. And you'll see why, uh, how, why and how it's being taught. Okay? So this is called natural deduction, but another way to call that is simply deduction, um, as you rationally would use it in your daily life. Okay? And so last time we learned quite a bit uh, in 6.6 .6 about uh, modus ponens, if P then Q, P, therefore Q. Right? And so that is a kind of reasoning you use all the time. If I go to the bar, then I will drink. I went to the bar, therefore I had a drink. Okay? Uh, you also use the disjunctive syllogism often. Right? Uh, either P or Q. P happened. A P did not happen. Therefore, Q. And again, you use that all the time. Either I'm going uh, to see... Um, the Saints game this weekend in person, or I'm going to watch it on TV. I didn't go to see the Saints game in person, therefore I watched it on TV. So if the first two are valid, the conclusion necessarily follows. And so on for all eight of the rules of implication that we saw in chapter 6.6. .6. What we're going to learn in 7.1 and 7.2 is how to apply those within premises to build even more premises to get to a conclusion. So in some sense it's working backwards, but it's a bit of puzzling out. And um, I'll work hard uh, to try to show you how that's done. So natural deduction, as we say here, is a method for deriving the conclusion of valid arguments. So we're only dealing with valid arguments expressed in the symbolism of propositional logic. So we're still dealing with formal or symbolic propositional logic. Now remember, in um, propositional logic, we have the operators of the horseshoe, if then. We have the op uh, operator of the point, or the and. We have the operator of the wedge, or the V, or the or symbol. And we have the operator of the tilde, or not. And we also have the if and only if, the triple bar. Okay? So those are the types of symbols that we get, uh, type of operators we get in propositional logic. With Venn diagrams, just to review really quickly, you get uh, all, none, or some. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, 
therefore Socrates is a mortal. Okay, and so you get those kinds of um, I'm going to get pop-ups because I put something on Facebook, uh, but you get all of those kinds of uh, those are the kinds of uh, things that we deal with in Venn diagrams, maybe all, none, or some. When we get to propositional logic, we're dealing with the operators that I just mentioned. And so the method consists of using sets of rules of inference, valid argument forms. And those valid argument forms are the all eight that you memorized already, or at least read through, in chapter 6.6 .6 and were given to you. That is, modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, and so on. And you're going to use that to derive a conclusion, or what you're really going to do is derive an intermediary uh, set of conclusions that link the premises of an argument with the stated conclusion. In other words, you're going to get two or three premises, you're going to get missing steps, you have to fill them in in order to get to the conclusion. Okay? So the four four rules of inference you should remember and this is the ones we are, these are the ones we are going to use in chapter 7.1, right? Uh, the first one is modus ponens. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. But note well, as I said in 6.6, .6, that what is P could be, it's just the form of the argument. So this has the same form even though this is not F, and even though this is G if and only if H. But see how not F repeats the same way that P repeats down here? and not F repeats down here, and then Q, this would be the Q spot, and this re repeats down here, well then we have modus ponens, we have the form of it. The same here with A or B, we have A or B down here, same as P up here, P down here, then not C or D, then not C or D, and the same thing here, okay? But note here, this is a very long argument form, but note here, it's a little bit out of order, but you can see that, again, it doesn't, the premises may not be in the exact order, but it gives you the same form of modus ponens. You also will get modus tollens again. Again, P, then Q. Not Q, therefore P. If I go to the bar, I'm going to have a drink. I didn't have a drink, therefore I didn't go to the bar. That's a valid form of argument, and it's a valid form of reasoning you use all the time. And that's what I'm trying to impress upon you. Okay, and again, as long as you can make it stand in, for that, like here you have K, not K, then you have not D or F, these stand in for this form of the argument. Same with this, same with this. The hypothetical syllogism, if P then Q, Q then R, if P then R, therefore, right? And again, don't be fooled even if it gets really complicated, huge number of brackets here, huge number of brackets here, as long as they are the same, and have the format, then you have the pure hypothetical syllogism. Okay? So you'll note that uh, that'll be important for when you're doing the deductive logic of, of, of natural deduction that we're going to be doing in chapter 7.1. Okay? So you have to look for this form. Okay? And again, uh, we have the disjunctive syllogism, right? So the hypothetical syllogism, just to give an example, if, um, if I study, uh, then I will do well in the test. If I do well in the test, then I will pass the class. I studied, therefore I passed the class. If I studied, then I will pass the class. And these are all examples, again, more complicated, sure, but if you see the three horseshoes, see the three horseshoes, see the three horseshoes, you know you're dealing with a pure hypothetical syllogism. Okay. The disjunctive syllogism, um, I already mentioned an example. Either I'm going to the Saints game or I'm watching it on TV. I didn't go uh, to the Saint game, Saints game, therefore I watched it on TV. And again, you may get more complicated uh, things for what stands in. Another letter, U stands in for P. Not a W and X, not both W and X, stands in for Q. Not you, therefore the other alternative has to be true. I'm not sure why I'm getting Commentary Magazine on there. There you go. Um, so common strategies uh, we'll come back to for constructing a proof involving involves this, but maybe take these notes down uh, before uh, we get into these, right? 
We always begin by attempting to find the conclusion in the premises. If the conclusion is not premise in the is not present in its entirety in the premises, look at the main operator of the conclusion. This will provide a clue as to how the conclusion will be derived. If the conclusion contains a letter that appears in the consequence of a conditional statement in the premises, consider obtaining that letter via modus ponens. Again, just take these as notes for now, and so on and so on. I, I think we'll go over these later, because in 7.2, we're going to get the other four rules of implication, and that's where we're going to go. But for now, let's leave PowerPoint aside, right, and go into uh, Chapter 7. Natural deduction. Okay, seven. Uh, let's do this. Hopefully, we'll do full screen. We won't get the pop-ups of odd things about impeaching Trump. I don't know how that. I don't even know what Commentary Magazine is, let alone how they have a pop-up on this particular computer. But in any event, um, so let's go through this. Uh, the method of natural deduction. Okay. So this section, of course, is introduces the method of natural deduction, which is used to derive a conclusion from a set of premises through a series of discrete steps. I should say that even though the, the, uh, the textbook itself uh, can sound a bit clunky at times, the examples it provides for each four of the operate each four of the rules of implication, that is, uh, modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, and uh, hypothetical syllogism, they're actually quite good. And so it's, it's one of the chapters uh, to make sure to read. And then do the assignments. And I suggest doing assignment uh, uh, part one first. And if you want the answers to any of those questions, uh, please feel free to ask me and I'll email them to you. Uh, the reason why I say it might be good to start with uh, part one and the the, those sets of question in, questions is they're like doing a mini step before you get into doing the full uh, sets of deductions. But in any event, the method of natural deduction depends on 18 rules of inference. In 7.1 and then 7.2, we're only going to do the first eight. The first four rules were given to us in 6.6 .6 as basic argument forms. Okay, And those basic argument forms we just saw. Modus ponens, modus ponens, Modus tollens, um, uh, disjunctive syllogism, and uh, pure hypothetical syllogism. So we know modus ponens, right? We abbreviate that as MP. That's going to be important because when you give your answer uh, for how you did this reasoning, you're going to use MP. You're not going to want to write out modus ponens, right? If P, then Q. P, therefore Q, right? Uh, this one, I think, is straightforward. The first line says that if we have P, then we have Q. And the second line says that we do have P, thus in the conclusion, we have Q. This is a very, this is a valid and actually quite used argument form. You use it every day. Again, even if you think you hate this logic class, even if you think uh, it is somehow useless, it is indeed not. You do this reasoning all the time, right? If I hear a piston blowing off in my engine, then I should stop the car. I hear the piston going off of my engine, I should stop the car. That is a valid argument form. We use modus ponens all the time, right? We use the hypothetical, then we found out the first part actually happened, and then you do the second, right? Right? If I find uh, that somebody is inebriated, then I will stop them from driving up in the car. I find them inebriated, in fact, and you might not find them, but it's telling us this is a fact, then you should stop them from driving a car. Again, reasoning, perfectly valid reasoning you use all the time. Okay. Modus tollens is one that is less straightforward, I think, for most students, but on the other hand, I think you, is one that you use all the time. The first line obviously says that if we have P, then we have Q. We're told that we don't have Q, and thus we do not have P. Now remember, there's an invalid argument form where we don't have the tildes in the front. So uh, but these were all valid argument forms, okay? So in 6.6, .6 we learned invalid forms, um, and I hope you took those to heart because then you won't do it. But I think this is another form of reasoning. Your friend says, if I go to the bar, dude, I'm going to get drunk, Just right? You, you might say it very informally. I spent four years in California, so the word dude drops into my language a bit. 
you see that your friend is not drunk, then you know your friend didn't go to the bar. Right? You use this form of reasoning all the time. Okay? And the pure hypothetical syllogism uh, is abbreviated, obviously, as HS. Uh, the first line says if we have P, then Q, we, then we have Q. Uh, the one, second one says if we have Q, then we have R. And then the last one, of course, is if P, then R. And as I've said all the time, you know you have it when you could just take it and just cross this out and you connect these two and then you have the conclusion. Okay? And so this is straightforward. If I go to the bar, then uh, I might drink too much. If I drink too much, I shouldn't drive. If I go to the bar, then I shouldn't drive. Use this form of reasoning all the time. Disjunctive syllogism. Except what we're doing here in the class, of course, is formalizing what you use all the time. Right? So this is called the method of elimination. I don't do one, I, but I end up doing the other. Go to... I'm either going to go to the Saints game or I'm going to see it on TV. I don't go to the Saints game in person, then I go see it on TV, as a good fan should. Okay. So note, for a conclusion to be drawn, the left-handed disjunct must be eliminated. But on the other hand, what we're going to find out is this could be Q or P. It just takes one to be eliminated for the other one to be true. So let's cross this out. That's not helpful. If this said not Q, if it said not Q here, you would know that P is true. Just one has to be eliminated. So think of it this way, and ignore what this says for now. Um, um, either I'm going to see the Saints game in person, or I'm going to watch it on TV. I didn't see it on TV, and if that's a true statement, I'm going to do either one of those things. And if that's true, and if I don't go, sorry, if I don't see it on TV, I didn't see it on TV, you find out from a friend, then you would gather that they went to see it in person. Right? Not Q. So, again, don't pay attention to this because uh, that's not helpful. All right. These are all four right there. And I suggest um, that what you do is have all four of these next to you uh, when you're doing the homework. Okay? And so you should be able to see that if we had these first two, that K would follow. That That, that is basically what question one is in the home. Uh, Part 1, question 1, and 7.1. Sorry to use all those numbers, but the first homework problem, right? Is if it H, then K. H, we're given H, then we know that K happens. And how do we know that? We say modus ponens. And what you would fill in on a homework assignment is modus ponens, MP, comma, how do I know this? 1 and 2. 1, 2, comma, MP. All right? So therefore, we justify this inference by that. Of course, we're going to get longer problems where we're missing a couple steps and we have to get to that conclusion. So the order of the premises, of course, never affect the validity of an inference. Just because H, if a H horseshoe K is here, just think of it mentally uh, as the reverse, and therefore 3 uh, K would follow. Okay? And again, it would be the same answer. 1, 2, the line numbers that give you that inference. So let's do some practice problems. This is going to involve all of these uh, first uh, four rules of inference. So what conclusion can we follow, does follow, if we know these two things, right? And these are the building steps. And so these are like the first uh, part one of the homework assignment. They're giving you the building steps to what's going to be able to give you the full ability to do deductive, natural reasoning by providing the extra steps you need. If I find out that F or G is true, and that not F is true, what follows? Well, we know this is the disjunctive syllogism as soon as we see the wedge or the V, as some of the students call it, right? Well, we know that G must be the case. I'm either going to the Saints game or not, or I'm going to see it in person. I'm sorry, I'm going to see the Saints game or I'm going to watch it on TV, right? F and G can represent anything. I didn't go to the Saints game in person, therefore G must be true, and it's a disjunctive syllogism. Anytime you see the wedge, you're dealing with the disjunctive syllogism, right? Or process of elimination. It's not this, therefore it has to be this. So what conclusion follows from these premises? Okay, now you should already know if you're a good test taker, 
We've got modus tonins. We, um, um, uh, sorry, modus ponens. We got uh, we got disjunctive syllogisms. So of course, next we're going to get probably some version of this modus tollens. So we get if t then z. If I go to the bar, then I'm likely to have a drink. I didn't have a drink, therefore I didn't go to the bar. That's modus tollens, and the lines that we're using for it are one and two. So the answer is not t. I did not go to the bar. Right? Can't be disjunctive syllogism. There's no wedge, right? And so here we're going to have the we if we see two of these uh, horseshoes, we're likely to get the hypothetical syllogism. But what conclusion can we draw? Well, we cross out this this m, these m's, and then we just go straight across. And the conclusion we draw is if s then t, right? There's no tildes. Uh, this is backwards. It must be this one. If S and T. This is pure hypothetical syllogism. And we get that from lines one and two. When we get into longer proofs or longer uh, forms of natural deduction, we're going to uh, have to, uh, uh, we're going to have multiple lines. And you're going to have to learn to ignore certain lines in order to see the pattern or the form of the argument that we're using. So if S, then T. Okay, so if I go to the Saints game, uh, then I will have mixed drinks. I'm trying to find something for M. If I have mixed drinks, uh, then the test will be hard. If I go to the Saints game, the test tomorrow will be hard. Okay, I'm just trying to make something that fits that. Probably should have less drinking examples. Okay, so that's a 1, 2, comma, HS, right? Hypothetical syllogism using lines 1 and 2. So again, always look for it. It may be out of order. What conclusion follows from these premises? And you're going to see this when you get to the full-on arguments. Okay? We have if R then Z, then R. Therefore, what follows? Z. This is modus ponens, except in a different order. Okay? So if I go uh, to the Saints game, uh, then um, I will have a good time. I went to the Saints game, therefore I had a good time. Okay, one, two, comma, um, modus ponens. Right, so we just need to mentally switch the order here of the premises. Remember, these are all premises. Later on, we're going to learn how to have how to do this uh, uh, for a conclusion. But right now, we're doing building steps. What conclusions necessarily follow from these premises? Okay, so I hope that makes sense. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Because three might be something that we need a, a totally different conclusion, but we need, may need three to build to something like four, and then five, and then get to the conclusion. Okay, but what naturally follows from that? Okay. So again, we have to visualize this in a different order, right? I didn't go to the Saints game. That's true. But either I'm going to the Saints game. Or, I'm going to watch it at home. Okay? Well, we know what follows from that. I watched it at home. K is 1, 2, disjunctive syllogism. Right? So it's mentally switched the premises. Okay? Again, we have another one where the, the, the 1 and 2 are backwards. They're not really backwards. There's no natural order that we have these things, but you should look for them. We have not E, F, horseshoe E. Right? If I go to the Saints game, then I'll have a good time. I didn't have a good time. Therefore, I didn't, not F, have, uh, didn't go to the Saints game. So it's not F. That's modus tollens 1, 2. Again, keep the, um, since the uh, quiz is our open book, but also, of course, the homework is, um, you should be able to look through here and see um, the form right away. Okay? You just men mentally switch the order of the premises. So what conclusion follows from these premises? Okay. Well, for me, the book would always have you reverse these, but you don't have to. You just cross out the W's. If you can see that alignment, you do I, horseshoe B, they follow in that order. I, horseshoe B, hypothetical syllogism 1, 2 is what it, you want. Know, lines 1 and 2 are what you are using. Okay. So if I go to the Saints game, 
um, then uh, I will have a good time. If I have a good time, then I'll be uh, very happy later on. I go to the Saint guy, Saints game, I'll also be happy later on. Right? It's not the best example, but that's what I'm coming up with on the fly here. Right? So again, mentally, they're saying mentally switch the order, but in fact, in a hypothetical syllogism, you can cross this way, or you can cross the other way if they if they're the same. So to use natural deduction effectively, you must be able to identify instances of the rules of inference among several lines of proof. And so often in every problem, you're going to have to use two um, of these forms of reasoning in order to get to the answer, right? And you must, uh, so you're going to get several rules of inference among several lines of proof. In doing so, you're going to have to learn to ignore what are lines that are relevant. So, for example, in this set of premises, lines 1 and 3 can be used to derive M by disjunctive syllogism. Do you see that? Right? We have not R, and then therefore M. Right? And so that's 1 and 3. But we ignore the second line. It's not needed. So sometimes we're given too much information. Right? We're given three premises that lead to this conclusion. Right? And this conclusion, though, in a longer proof can help us to lead to more and more. Another way of saying that actually is in your in your papers that you write for other classes um, and in real life you don't just have one argument. You make an argument that builds into another argument which builds into another argument which builds to your main conclusion. Okay? And so that's what's happening here. We're learning that natural deduction to link across um, link across different forms of reasoning. So here's the proof. Uh, so that's the proof, sorry. So now let's work some practice problems involving three or more premises. In working these problems, you should begin by examining the premises and then determining the conclusion that follows. Do not be begin by examining the list of answers. So what conclusion follows? They're helping to move you in baby steps here before we actually get to an argument. Okay? What conclusion follows from here? Okay, right? And horseshoe D, right? Well, we know that N naturally follows from modus ponens. Sorry, D follows from modus ponens. If N, then D, then N. Then, sorry, and N is true, then D follows by modus ponens. Okay? Now, this isn't a hypothetical syllogism between these two, right? We don't see any of the same letters at a cross from one another, right? So it's we're using modus ponens, we're ignoring number two, and so I ignore number two, one, three, and it's modus ponens, okay? So what conclusion can we follow from here? Again, we might have to ignore one of the premises. Well, we have two that are uh, actually, if you just ignore number two, we went across and we see the J's, we can cross those out, we would have a hypothetical syllogism where we go if H, then X, right? So we if H, then X, we have that one, three, and it's hypothetical syllogism. But before I cross that out um, and show that to you, right, notice we're ignoring J and R, just mentally uh, um, putting our hands over it and blocking it out. If H, then J, if J, then X, therefore, if H, then X. That's the hypothetical syllogism. Okay, and what lines did we use for that proof? We used lines one and three. Okay. So here, again, we're going to have to guess, and this is what is going to be good when we get to the arguments, is that there is a matter of creativity and guesswork here. So whereas the truth tables of chapter six, in some sense, are um, uh, wrote, Right? You're just filling them out, filling them out, filling them out. Uh, here, um, you're actually allowed a bit of creativity and thinking. Right, And uh, just think of it as like a game um, that, that you're doing, that you're trying to figure out a puzzle. And so that's why, for some people, this can be fun. It's certainly easier than calculus, I'll give it that. Um, but this is why it can be fun, um, or at least quasi-fun, because you are trying to figure out a puzzle. But not only that, 
the upshot is you're learning proper reasoning at the same time. Okay? So, we look at this, and we have three premises. And so, what follows from these premises? So, let's, we have not n. Now, we could think we have two horseshoes. So, we could have hypothetical syllogism, but these are in the same spot. They're not across from one another. We have not n. And we have if l, then n. If we have not n, then we know that l follows from that. Why do we know that? Because we do modus tollens, one and three. Okay. So again, you just have to look at the form, right, uh, of the four forms that hopefully you have written down next to you as you're listening to this, um, right? And they're in the back of the hardcover as well, and in the beginning of the chapter of 7.1, and also uh, in at the end of chapter 6.6. So what conclusion follows from these premises? Either C or Z, either Z or W, not Z, right? Uh, well, which one would that fit for? Well, if we find that this is not Z, well, then C would be true, right? One and three. We could have Z or W, not C. W could be true using two and three. These are actually both true. But they're going to want you to answer this. Why? Because they, they haven't introduced the idea that you can just switch the order around. Not Z, the alternative is true. Not Z, the alternative is true. Process of elimination. Okay? But they'll give you this one as correct. Disjunctive syllogism. But I should point out, if you have this, uh, um, not C, Z, C is also true, and you can put that on a line five if you were using an argument form. Okay, we learn that later as well of commutativity, but you also know that by process of elimination. If one is false, the other has to be true. Either I go to the Saints game in person, or I see it on TV. You find out your friend didn't watch it on the TV, therefore they went to it. Right. So again, um, I think they should just introduce that here. Okay. So what conclusion follows from these premises? So now we have a bit more to work with, right? We have four lines to work with. If uh, E, then H. If H, F, then L. E, then L. Okay? Well, in fact, um, what can we work with? Well, we don't have a hypothetical syllogism here, right? These don't match. But we do have modus ponens, right? We have the first part shown to be true of what is a hypothetical uh, statement above, right? If H then, if E then H, each E, therefore H. So we know H is in it, and we use it in lines one and three. And so line four, we didn't even have to use. Okay. So what conclusions follow from these premises? If T then G, if S then N, if uh, G then F, not G. Okay, so now we have four premises. Now, we might look for, we see a lot of horseshoes. So that leads us into three different types. We have four that we've learned, we're working with in this chapter. We have a hypothetical syllogism. So let's knock that out. Let's see if we can do anything with that. Are any of these across from one another? Well, we do have this. We could have if T then F, right? Right? These follow, right? But we're not given that as one of the answers. Okay. Um, so why not look for uh, what would be next? Modus ponens. Well, we're not told that one of the first of these is true. In fact, we're told the opposite, right? Not G is true. Well, where would that help us? Up here on number one. Number one and four put together is T if T then G, not G, right? Means not T. If I go to the Saints game, then I'll have a good time. I didn't have a good time, therefore I didn't go to the Saints game. So not T is modus tollens, and you're using uh, 1 and 4. Okay? So, But again, look here and see that in longer argument forms, what we're going to do is first fill out, when we get to the arguments finally, and they don't say that here yet, you're going to fill out everything you can figure out already. Okay? Uh, but you're going to work backwards for, because you're looking to prove uh, what will, I keep going here because what you're going to do is put down all the premises and then the conclusion 
gets put down with a slash and then over here. Okay. So what conclusions follow from these premises? S or W, W then D, H then D, D then W. All right, well, we don't have a not S or not W, so we can't do anything really with uh, a disjunctive syllogism. Uh, we have a lot of horseshoes, but we don't have any of the um, beginning uh, positive as a fact. We don't have W, H, or D positive as number five as a fact. We don't have not D or not D or not B, so it can't be so that would, it can't be modus ponens. Can't be modus tollens because we don't have not D or not D or not B. So we must be in the land of what? We must be in the land of the hypothetical syllogism. These cross out. We have if H then B. Right? H and B is here, 3 and 4, gives us a hypothetical syllogism. Right? And so we ignore 1 and 2 altogether. Okay? So what conclusion follows from these premises? If R then K, not R. A, and then 3. If A, then R. Okay? Uh, and then K. Okay. So what follows from these premises? All right, don't look at the answers yet. Well, in fact, we do have what's a hypothetical syllogism. We cross these out, if A, then K. Do we see that above? No. All right, so, but that is one you could fill out later on if you're filling out a longer argument. So that does follow. Not R, does not R tell us anything? Yes, it does. If we go A, then R, not R, Therefore, we get not A if we use modus tollens, right? And that's using lines 2 and 3. If I go to the Saint It's game, I'll have a good time. I don't have a good time. Therefore, not A, I didn't have a good time. I, I didn't go to the Saints game. 2 and 3, modus tollens. And so you ignore this one, and you ignore this one. Okay, so let's get some practice problems. What conclusion follows from these premises? Now, I should say, these are building blocks because in the end, you're going to beginning, uh, be beginning uh, in natural deduction with what an argument gives you. That is, what a conclusion is, and then try to show how it works and build in the premises. That's where we ultimately want to get. So, we're given M or D. M is true. S, if S, then Q. If B, then Q. And if M, then A. Now, they tell you not to look at the answers, but let's face it, if M or D, M, that doesn't tell us anything about this. We're given is F, S, then Q. If B, then Q, we don't have any crossover there. We do have if M, then A, and we're told that M is true. Well, that's modus ponens. If I go to the Saints game, then I'll have a good time. I went to the Saints game, therefore A, I had a good time. Two and five gives us modus ponens. Okay? Let's see what we can do from these, right? Again, we could be looking for a hypothetical syllogism. Do we see anywhere where the H's cross over? We do. Could be K then I. And indeed, we have that. If K then I, 1 and 4, right? So you ignore all of these. You cross, uh, sorry, let me make sure I got that right. If K then, okay, so let's see this. Uh, if H then I, well, we're not given in any of these a not of the consequent, that is the second one. We're not giving, a, uh, we're not affirming the antecedent, which we do in modus ponens, that is, H is true, or M is true, or K is true, or T is true. So we must be in the realm of, as all of you say, uh, hypothetical syllogism. So if H then I, does that match with that? No, these are in the same place. These are different letters altogether. We ignore three, okay? Um, if K then H, oh yeah, we can cross that out. We have if K then I, and we get one and four hypothetical syllogism, right? See, these is, this is the same, this is the same, and then just we just go across, ignoring two and three. It's harder to visualize, I know, right here. Okay. What conclusion follows from these premises? If G then M, K or M, not uh, N or F, N, not K. Now, we might look for modus tollens, but we don't have a not M. We might look for modus ponens, but we don't have G given as a premise, that is a true premise. Uh, then 
we don't have two we don't have two hypothetical statements, so we can't have a hypothetical syllogism. So we must be looking for what? Perhaps in using this one uh, to give us a disjunctive syllogism. Now n here does not tell us that f is automatically true, so that's not it. So it must be k or m, not k, therefore m, 2 and 5, disjunctive syllogism. So the next important point to learn is that compound statements, including negations, can be substituted in place of p, q, and r of the rules of inference. I went over that when we were going over through the PowerPoint presentation uh, that I uh, put together for the chapter. Okay. So an example would be not s, therefore m, then n, not s, therefore m. So notice this is taking the p position, if p then q, if p, therefore q. That is modus ponens. Okay. Right? You substitute not s in the place of where p once was. And again, this could get very complicated. It could be a whole parenthetical phrase. It could be within brackets, parentheses within brackets. But the form is the same. Okay. Oh, shoot. I think I did something there. So um, all we do here, again, we have uh, parentheses, g, horseshoe, j, and k. We have g. And therefore, what follows the horseshoe, which is the Q position, J and K, modus ponens. So what conclusion follows from these premises? Look, these are the same. So now we know that it is a hypothetical syllogism, right? If P, then Q. If, P, if Q, then R. Therefore, if P, then R, right? So we cross these out, and we get if P, then not A. That's one, two, hypothetical syllogism. So what conclusions follow from these premises? Not H, then not B. Not H, right? Therefore, not B. This is in the P position, and this is in the Q position, right? Not B, one and two. Okay, so we're back to modus ponens. So what conclusion follows from these premises? Another practice problem. Not Z or not M. And then we have not, not Z. They've made it very easy. They could have just put in Z for you, um, as they did in 6.6, in right? We're eliminating this one. Therefore, not M has to be true, right? Either it's not the case that I go to the same game, or it's not the case that I watch it on TV. I did not not go to the Saints game. Therefore, I must have got, not gone uh, to watch it on TV. Now, that was a very bad example, but I hope hopefully the point is made. Disjunctive syllogism, of course, and we're using lines one and two. So it is not M. We've eliminated this, we have this. So with the wedge or the V, again, always process of elimination. We have S, if uh, sorry, not odd R, and we have not S, then not R. Okay? Now this is a negation of the of the consequent, right? Of, that is, remember always, antecedent comes before the consequent in a hypothetical syllogism. Antecedent, A before C. Antecedent, consequent, A before C, right? And so we're denying the antecedent, which is another way of saying modus tollens, right? So not S, and then we have to not not this. And that would be uh, modus tollens, not not S. Right, using one and two. By the way, that's this too. I don't know why they put that. Not not s is equal to s, but they'll get to that later. Okay, uh, that was introduced already in six point six. Not not s is equal to six. Oh, sorry, equal to s. Sorry. Right. If you say something is, it is not the case that John doesn't want to go. That means John wants to go. Right. So what conclusion follows from these premises? K, horseshoe, F or M, K, right? That is the form of obviously modus ponens, right? We have the K, we're given if then, the horseshoe, we're given that the first part is true, then this has to follow, okay? F or M, we're using one or two modus ponens. Okay, uh, 
Uh, let's click OK. What conclusion to follow from these premises? If C, then not, uh, sorry, if C, um, then both N and P. Not both N and P. Well, obviously we're in the mood, we're denying the consequent, which is another way of saying modus tollens, and therefore not C uh, has to be the case here. We're having modus tollens, that's the format we have. They have to, every time they put a C or a Z in, I sound like I'm talking about Nazis. Uh, but there you go. Okay. What conclusion follows from these premises? So you're learning, in some sense, using just those four tools, what we, can we conclude from this? Later on, we'll be working backwards, but what I like about this chapter is it tells you, okay, what can I do with these, all of these valid forms of arguments? Okay. So, W or A, then N, not B, then W or A. Okay. So, we don't have stated as a fact the first part of a premise, so that knocks out modus ponens. Um, we don't have um, not B. What is that going to give us? Right? Um, we don't have hypothetical syllogism, do we? No, um, because not these. Oh, we do. We have hypothetical syllogism because these are the same. So it's not B, then not N, then N, and that's hypothetical syllogism, right? You cross out what are the same uh, things, and then you just follow it across, right? Normally they'll tell you to reverse these. There's no need to. When they're just across from one another, you just cross them out, and then you put an arrow sign, not B, then N, right? And there you go. Uh, one and two, hypothetical syllogism. Not B, therefore N. Not D, B, then N. Glad to watch the, uh, by the way, the online YouTube videos of the other people who uh, record their lectures and see the follow-ups they do. It makes me feel better when I say therefore instead of if then, that sort of thing. So what conclusions follow from these premises? Well, I think very quickly you can conclude we have the wedge, so it's got to be disjunctive syllogism. Get rid of that right away. We have not I, again, process of elimination. Therefore, we must have if n, then q. Again, that's taking up the p or q position. i takes up the p position, this takes up the q position. right? And so, uh, n, then q, 1, 2, disjunctive syllogism. Right? Again, this is the process of elimination one. So what conclusion follows from these premises? s or v, then j. We're told s or v classical uh, uh, modus ponens, right? So if we switch these, you'll see it more easily that this is in the P position, this is in the Q position. So the conclusion must be J, one and two, those are the two lines that we used, modus ponens, okay? What conclusion follows from these premises? Not D, not both D and A, then um, if not both D and A, then H, not H. Well, we know that when we're den denying, that is negating, the consequent, we have to also deny the antecedent as the uh, conclusion. That is called modus uh, tollens, and therefore it's going to be not not DNA, which, by the way, is also DNA. But they want you to do this for now. Later on, you'll learn uh, the other one is correct as well. So what conclusion follows from these premises? S and G, if S and both S and G, then uh, D and F, if D and F, both D and F, then W. Well, we can see that this is the same as this one. They're at a cross from one another, so it follows if S and G, then W, that's your conclusion. If S and G, then W, hypothetical syllogism. Okay. Uh, what conclusion follows from these premises, right? Well, this is again process of elimination, and we have a wedge. So this must be disjunctive syllogism. It's not this, therefore it has to be this. Okay, it follows the same form. P or Q, not P, therefore Q. Okay, so this disjunctive syllogism it has to be B then R, 1 then 1, 2. 
So what conclusion follows from these premises? Uh, G, if G, then not, not, not either, Z or K. Not, not, Z or K. Well, we know that's modus tollens, right? We're denying the consequent, which is another way of saying modus uh, tollens, and we use it from 1 and 2, and therefore the conclusion is not G. Not G. Okay. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. And it's just, don't let the double negatives throw you off. It's throwing an extra negative there to tell you that this has to be negated as the proper deductive conclusion. So now let's do some practice problems following for more than two premises. Remember to begin by examining the premises and finding the conclusion. Do not begin by examining the list of answers. That's what they tell you to do. That's fine by me. So what conclusion can we follow from these premises? So this is where it gets a little more complicated because we know we're going to be ignoring one of these. Well, let's look at the first two premises. And I'm actually going to say, look for them below. I don't think that's good um, instructions. Why? A or S, then B, not B. Well, we know with modus tollens that modus tollens, this would give us A or S. But that's not one of them. So that's one that does follow. Okay? Um, but we have A or S, then N. Then what do we have? Okay? Well, these are not across from one another. So it does have to be not, it does have to be A or S. Right? You have not B, therefore not A or S. It has to be modus tollens. Okay? And that's one and two. Okay? Because this one we ignored. This doesn't give, help us to do anything with these. Okay? Because these are on the same side. That's not hypothetical syllogism. Right? So just do a process of elimination. What information am I given that's useful? Right? Not A or S. Modus tollens. What conclusion follows from these premises? If G, then M or D. Either E or D. G or both S and T, G. Well, given the G, using this line, we know the modus tollens is going to, uh, modus ponens is going to follow, M or D. Do we see that? M or D? Yep, one and three. Modus ponens. Okay? If I'm going too quickly, I apologize, um, but I think some of these should be relatively straightforward. We ignore this one, because G, if G is true, it doesn't tell us anything about the, uh, whether this is true or not. There's no, nothing eliminated. Right? So M or D, we are told something here. Modus ponens. Right? If I go to the game, then either uh, Michael is going to come or David's going to come. I'm going to go to the game, therefore either Michael is going to come or David's going to come. Okay? You use this reasoning all the time. Right? You, one of your two friends, you have one ticket. One of them is going to come, you've called them both, whoever gets to you first gets the ticket. Okay? Uh, what conclusion follows from these premises? F or S, not S then, uh, either um, uh, F or M, not not S, F or M, then not D. Okay, so let's look. So F or S, we don't see that repeated anywhere. We do see uh, that these are, are crossed from one another. So it could be a hypothetical syllogism where we go not S, then not D. So let's see if we see that below. Not S, then not D. Two and four, hypothetical syllogism. It is indeed there. Okay. Now not not S is not going to help you here because not not S is equal to S. And so it's not going to tell you that F is true. They should have had that as one of those just to, um, to make it a little bit more difficult. But there you go. Um, uh, F or M. They're at a cross from other, not S, then not D. Right? Hypothetical syllogism. So what follows from this? Uh, I'm probably not going to read these all again, uh, but D, then P or S, it, uh, L, then D, if L, then D, not, if L, then P, D. All right, so what's going to help us here? All right, so we have a wedge. We'd want to look for a not on one of those to prove the other side. So we do. We have a not D, then P. We have a not this, process of elimination. Do we have an S down here? Yes, we do. Look at that. Disjunctive syllogism. Okay. So you see, with practice, it becomes quicker and quicker. Okay, even for me. Um, 
All right, so what conclusions follow from these premises? Again, this looks very, very complicated, and yet in the end we have four simple rules that we're following. Not R, then, both P and not T. Uh, not P and, not both P and not T, or N. Uh, not both P and not T, um, et cetera, et cetera. S, then R. Okay, so this is a little bit of guesswork here. We have not R, then not P and T. Do we have a not R given to us as a statement? No, we don't have modus ponens that we can use with that. Um, we do have not P and not T, and we have that in the second position here, so we might have modus tollens. So let's see if we have a not not R, and indeed we do, modus tollens. So you see that? So this has the form of modus tollens. If P then Q, not Q, which means really not not P and not T, um, therefore not not R. Okay, modus tollens, right? One and three. So what conclusion follows from these premises? If J, then K or M, J or wedge, not P. If S, then J, not K. All right. So what helps to give us some information? Well, not K, well, it's not going to really help us there um, because it's stuck within a whole uh, longer statement. So it's not going to tell us M is true. Um, J or not P. Is that going to help us? No, because we're not told that one, of, we're not given a process of elimination there. Um, but we do have, what? A crossover here. If we ignore two, the J is the same. And so we have the hy pure hypothetical syllogism. S, if S, horseshoe, K or M. S, horseshoe, K or M, one or three hypothetical syllogism. So what conclusions follow from these premises in the next problem? Right, uh, K then N, if A, a K then N, then both A and D, A and D, N horseshoe D, G or S, uh, K uh, horseshoe N. Okay, so let's look at this. What can we do work with? Well, we don't have anything in the front stated. Oh, we do. State as a fact. We do. The first one is state as a fact. So go through process elimination. Can we do modus ponens, modus tollens? disjunctive syllogism or hypothetical syllogism. Well, if we're told this part is true, we know from modus ponens, if P then Q, P, this is the whole thing, P, therefore Q, A and D. Is A and D given here? Yes, it is. One for modus ponens. Okay, what conclusions follow from these premises? Right, we have if H then T, wedge, not Q, T then R, if T then R, then M, not both uh, A horseshoe T and not R. Okay, so what does this help us with? Well, let's look down. We have, let's start with disjunctive syllogism. Okay, do we have a process of elimination? Do we have a not, not Q or not A then a T? Well, we do have that in line three. So that would say not Q is true, right? We Got rid of this, this has to be true. And there we are. Uh, disjunctive syllogism, there we go. Right? Using lines one and three. So now, uh, let's now turn to a kind of problem where you must find a missing premise to derive a stated conclusion. Okay? Find the missing line. So this is a part two, I think, of the questions in the uh, book chapter itself. Okay. For example, suppose you were given three premises on lines one through three and a conclusion on line five. What premise must you put on line four to derive the stated conclusion? So these are possible premises. If W then M, not B then W, R or not W, therefore W. What would give you W here? Okay will not be, right? Not B would tell you W is true, right? Modus ponens. When you examine the premises, you should be able to see that if you had not B on line four, the conclusion would follow from lines two and four by modus ponens. 
You can't derive the conclusion in any other way. If you tried these two, you wouldn't be able to get it from the other uh, premises. Okay? Thus, you select not B from the list of premises. So let's now practice this. Remember, begin by examining the conclusion in the state of premises. Do not be examining it. I tell you again, don't look at the answers. All right, so block those out. What premises would we have to have to get to R? Okay, so don't look to the right. If R, then P, G or not R, P and M, or R. Well, to get to R, you can't do modus um, ponens because R would have to be given as one of the premises. You can't do modus tollens, so that's not going to work. Um, disjunctive syllogism wouldn't give you that this isn't the case. Um, so you would have to be told not P and M. Wedge, not R. So not P or M would have to be true. Process of elimination gives you R. So it's not P or M. Okay. Disjunctive syllogism, line three and now four, the, the one you provided. What premise must you put on line four to derive the conclusion on line five? This is harder. Uh, but given that these are all um, that these are all um, hypothetical statements, you can you can bet that it's going to be probably a hypothetical syllogism you'll need, right? So what would give us C then R? Well, if we had if C then B, because then it would match with number one, right? If B then R, if um, C then uh, B, we cross out the B's, therefore we have if C then R. And they don't have that, right? So that's not going to work. Um, did I screw that up? If C then R, it's not if R then C, that doesn't work. Um, it's not D then R. Okay, all right. So let's see, is there any others where the hypothetical syllogism matches up. Oh, well, we do. We have this, which would give us if B, then B and D, right? And that, that would give us R. Uh, so let's try, let's see this one, right? And it'll tell us, right? That if it's, if uh, this choice gives C, then R by hypothetical syllogism with line D, right? So if you have B then R, if B and D then R, right, you cross out the B's and D's, you get C then R. So what premise must you put on line four to derive the conclusion on line five? So we have not H, right? So we could think, uh, well, it might be C, but that doesn't tell you that this is not true because remember, just because one part is true, the other isn't. You would have to be told not C, but that would only tell you that H is true. Okay, uh, if we had not uh, K here, that wouldn't tell you anything about not H. Not H is certainly not given to you, and you can't put in the conclusion in the premises. But what if you were told not C? Oh, well then you would get not H by using modus tollens, right? From line one. Oh, I should have kept that longer, right? But hopefully that made sense. So here, S or M, then K, not G, then S or M, M, horseshoe S, etc., gives us S or M. What premise can we put on line four to make five follow? Okay, so we need to get to S or M, right? Now we can't use modus ponens because that's what we're looking to get to, um, at least for there. What if we had not G though? Oh, well then not uh, then S or M would be would follow, right? That is in the P then Q position in modus ponens, not G, therefore S or M. Oh. Okay. So we're gonna again find the missing line. Uh, what premise must you put on the line four to derive the conclusion of line five? Okay. If E then not J. Q then W, not L then E, uh, I have J horseshoe E. Okay, so this might give me uh, an idea that we're looking for something like a hypothetical syllogism. 
Okay? Maybe. Okay? Um, let's see. Uh, we have E and He there. E and E there. So, um, but that would only prove J of an E. Um, we could have, uh, let's see. We need to get to E, right? So we could have um, what would cross out one of these hypotheticals, right? To get to J and E. So we need to have keep the E's, so we don't want them crossed out. So we need something where uh, the E's, uh, where it follows, okay? So uh, if we did um, J horseshoe not L, that would give us J horseshoe not L. That would give us those two. Okay? That is, it would follow that uh, J horseshoe E. So not L, horseshoe not E, J horseshoe not L. You cross out the not L, then you get the J horseshoe not E. Right? So that is a proper hypothetical syllogism from 3 and 4. Okay? So what premises must we put in line 4? to get to not not k. Okay. So, again, our four uh, rules of inference that we're using thus far, hypothetical syllogism, uh, disjunctive syllogism, modus ponens, and modus tollens. Okay. So, what would we do to get to not not k? Well, I don't know if disjunctive syllogism would do any, do any work here, um, because we're told not not g, then it's not going to prove not not k. Um, if we had um, not w though, this would give us modus tollens, modus tollens, and we would get not not k. So how about not not, sorry, not w gives us not not k. Lines one and four give us the conclusion, right? Modus tollens. Again, you just have to play around with the four that we have. So that's the good part about this chapter, is you're not given an infinite amount of number of, of, of those that are useful. So what premise must you put on line four to derive the conclusion on line five? If F then A, K wedge, not F, C and W, uh, then F, boom, then F. Well, clearly, just right away, we can see modus ponens would give us C and W. If we had C and W, then F would follow from modus ponens. And there we go. Okay? This choice gives us F by modus ponens. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. All right? So we have here uh, F and R, then P. Uh, P wedge, both F and R. P wedge F. How do we get to F and R? Okay? Well, we get it to it by not P, just by process of elimination. Sorry if I'm being quick, but again, you just look for it. There it is. If you do process of elimination on a wedge, we're not looking for F, but we are looking for not P, and so not P gives us F and R, the other side. Right? Either go uh, to the park, or I play Frisbee and rollerblade. Right? I don't go to the park, therefore I play Fisbee and Rollerblade. So we're Nets work through a proof involving several steps. We'll pick one from the textbook. Here are the premises. F wedge G, F horseshoe H, not G, H horseshoe G um, horseshoe I. Okay. And the conclusion to be derived is always written to the right of the last premise, separated by a slash mark. This is so. This is where we were always headed. Okay, is to prove that this follows from these three premises. But we might need to put in a few steps to make that argument follow. Okay. So how would we have to do this, right? Well, of course, the conclusion could never be used to derive a line in a proof. It merely indicates where the proof is supposed to end. Okay? So there's not going to be a line in there. But this all can lead us there. You're never going to be led to an invalid argument. 
Okay, it's going. There's enough information in here that using modus tollens, modus tollens, modus ponens, disjunctive syllogism, and hypothetical syllogism, they will all help you. So a proof strategy is always begin your proof by looking at the conclusion and attempting to find it in the premises. In other words, we're looking for uh, f then i. Okay, so how are we going to get to f then i? Okay, and working such problems as this, you'd always look by the conclusion and try to find it there. Okay, so we're trying to find how do we get there. Okay, the conclusion is a conditional statement. This should make you, right, think of a hypothetical syllogism which always produces conditional statements. Right, I've said that before. Okay, so looking at these premises in lines one and in line four. These two statements would give you the conclusion by hypothetical syllogism. But you must first obtain G then on, I, then on, on a line by itself. So I need to show, right, you would need to show how do I get G then I on a line by itself so that I can get F then I. Okay? Well, you would have to look to prove H. And how would you prove H? You would have to show... Um, that not F is correct. Well, not G is given to us, so we're going to be able to use modus tollens. Not G gives us F, not F gives us H, H gives us by modus ponens, G then I, then we write this down, and then eventually we get to F, using hypothetical syllogism, if F then I. So we look for the H, right? Uh, line 2 will give you H by disjunctive syllogism if you use not F. So let's look for not F. There we go. Line 1 will give you not F by modus tollens if you have a not G. Thus look for not G. Whoop, there it is. Right? The proof is now completely thought out. Right? Um, to construct the proof, you go through these steps in reverse or order. First, not F. You've got to get not F in there. Right? First, not F is obtained by lines 1 and 3 by modus tollens. Right? Not G, therefore not F. Right? One and three. And you put uh, next to that line uh, your reasoning for getting there. Lines one and three, modus tollens. Okay? Then you obtain H, not F, gives us H by way of disjunctive syllogism. Two and five, disjunctive syllogism. Next you obtain G and I by modus tollens. Modus ponens. I keep doing that with modus ponens and modus tonens. Right? Okay. So uh, we get G, therefore, then I. And we need to get there. Why? Because then we can combine 1 and 7 to get to if F, then I. And by the way, this last line should always be used in your final line of proof. You're going to say 1 and 7 using what? Hypothetical syllogism. Okay, one and seven hypothetical syllogism. So you see how you were given, I think, at the beginning, um, just four premises, but you were able to fill in three more that follow from them. Three premises that you produced on your own, working backwards from knowing what the conclusion was to be. Okay. So now in the premises, then try to think through the entire derivation. Okay, so we have not H, so let's look there quickly. This is where we're going to be looking for, right? And so we're going to be looking, we're given not R, and therefore not H, right? Um, and so um, we're going to see where this can get us, all right? All right, so let's see. So what do you write on line four? Okay. Well, we don't write not H. Why? We're already given it in the conclusion. You do not write the conclusion ever in the list of premises. Um, how would we know G, though? Disjunctive syllogism. So we write everything that we know first. So we go through these and we go, 
Well, if I have not R and I have R or G, write it down. Now, it could be in the, uh, it doesn't matter. When you go through, you write down what you know first. Okay, so yes, you do work backwards from the conclusion knowing where you're headed, but I always start by going, what do I know already? And that's usually the first place you're going to end up going. All right, so not R gives us G, process elimination, by disjunctive syllogism. Okay? Okay, so now that we know G, what do we know? We know H then R, right, by modus ponens. G then H then R gives us G and we have G as a fact, then 5 would be H and R. Again, work forward uh, knowing what we do know. H then R is now true. 1 and 4 modus ponens. Okay? So then what do we write on line 7? Remember, we're looking to get to not H. Well, we need to have not R. Well, actually, we already know this. Not H is the conclusion. Not R plus this, not R, therefore not H, that's modus, tonin, uh, modus tollens, right? Uh, not R, not R is a fact, gives us not H as a conclusion, that's what we wanted, and so we write 1, uh, 3, 5, not H, modus tollens. Okay, and therefore you're done. That's your line 6. But then look at what you, all that you did we're able to do just by reasoning backwards and then a little bit forward. Here's another problem. It requires just three lines to complete it before beginning. Think through the solution. Okay, so we have w wedge and then k. Well, that's a big clue. If we could eliminate w, that would actually get us there. So at some point, we're going to have to eliminate w, and I think we can. How can we eliminate w? Well, we have not e. That tells us not w. So by using um, modus tollens, we get to not W. Then using disjunctive syllogism, process elimination, we know M then K. M then, oh, M then K, sorry, that is wrong. And then we're going to have to use hypothetical syllogism and then get M then D. So we, get, we prove that this is the case, M then K. Then if you, if you can just visualize it for a second, we cross those out, and then we have M horseshoe D. So we're going to have three steps of a hypothetical syllogism. I love how they say just complete three lines, but you see how we had to sort of work backwards there to get to M then D. So again, when you're given this horseshoe, you know that your last probable, probable line of proof is um, um, going to be hypothetical syllogism. Okay, so what do we write on the next line? So let me try to remember from the last page as I'm getting a little hungry here at lunchtime. Uh, and my memory always goes, right? Uh, the next line we're going to write, knowing not E, we show not W. And that's line 3 and 4, Otis Tollens. Good. Now not W gives us M then horseshoe K, right? M horseshoe K, and that's 1 and 5 from disjunctive syllogism. We already went through that. Okay. I understand this is difficult, don't worry about it. Um, it takes some work, it takes plenty of practice, and again, if you want the answer key to chapter 7.1, I would be glad to provide it uh, so that you can do a lot of practice. Okay? All right. So, uh, what was next? So we have M horseshoe K, um, and we want to prove M then D, and we already have that, right? So. The two, the two K split out, then we have him, horseshoe D. We have hypothetical syllogism 2 and 6. Okay, again, notice how you're ignoring all of these lines. Okay, give yourselves a little congratulations if you were able to follow that along. Okay, but notice how much you had to fill in to get there. But again, you're just looking to see what you can prove. Okay. So what we write on the next line. So we have S horseshoe and or whatever and so on. T or S, not T, not N. And we need to get to not G, which means we have to break into this. Okay? And which means at some point we're going to need what? We're going to have to eliminate this. So and it means we're going to have to eliminate T. 
and we have not t, so we prove s. So let's do that. We've already proven s, right? Good. Uh, s is already there. Why have we already proven it? Disjunctive syllogism. Not t gives us, right? You write down what you know already. Disjunctive syllogism, t or s. If it's not t, s has to be the case. You write that down as your next premise. Okay, now we have s. Well, where else do we see s? We see s up here. Good. Now we know that this whole bracket follows y, modus ponens. Okay, so let's go n wedge g then t, this long thing, uh, from modus ponens. 1 and 5. Okay, so that's good. Now we're still looking to get to not g. So do we have not n? Yes. Disjunctive syllogism, we have to get to g and t. So disjunctive syllogism is next, and we're going to use 4 and 6, right? Process elimination, g and t, if g then t has to be correct. All right? This is about as long as it'll get. And then you go, okay. And then what do we write on the next line? Well, we have only certain, we have to get to not g. How do we get to not g? The one way using this is not t, modus tollens. We already have not t as given as one of the premises. So if g then t, not t, therefore not g. 3 and 6 gives you modus tollens. Oh, sorry, did I press the wrong one? Not g, 3 and 7. I have to get my numbers right. Okay. 3 and 7. Uh, there we are. Okay. I probably should have waited a second and gone back through it, but we'll have another practice problem. So what do we write on the next line? Again, we're looking to get to b and q, so let's find where if b then q. Well, this is probably going to be a hypothetical syllogism at the end, but for now, what do we already know? We already know, let me look here, look here, this doesn't give us any information there because that's a wedge. These don't match up, so it's not a hypothetical syllogism. Ah, but we have modus tollens. We have not L, we have L, we have denying the consequent, which is modus tollens, therefore not R. And we use 2 and 4 to get that on there. Good. Now, that's going to give us what? Disjunctive syllogism, then we prove that this exists. Um, not L, then B, then M. 1 and 5, disjunctive syllogism. Okay, keep going through with what you can prove with what's above. Okay. So, um, if we know not L, then B, then M, right, um, we know that B and M is true using modus ponens, right, right, not L, P, therefore Q, and then Q, P, therefore Q, not L, then this, not L, then this, and so it's going to be B, then M, 4 and 6, okay. All right, so now what do we write on the next line? Remember, we're trying to get to B and Q. So are we able to do that yet? Do we have Bs that are lined up with Q? Well, yes, we do. We have two Ms. If we put these together, that could be crossed out, cross that out. If they were right next to each other, you'd see it would be a line crossed out. B, horseshoe, Q. B, horseshoe, Q, 3, 7, hypothetical syllogism. Okay, and there's your conclusion, and you got there through natural deduction. Okay, all right, um, and so there we are, um, uh, having done a number of problems to do, showing first how to suck to set up arguments, uh, then uh, doing them yourselves, and then uh, again, um, working all the way to put in all, uh, use, in the last problem at least, all four rules of implication that we're using for this chapter uh, to get to our conclusion. So that's excellent. Um, and so if you're able to follow that, that's excellent. If you're not, I can't recommend highly enough, uh, especially this time, uh, the other YouTube video, uh, but also come to meet me during office hours. I'm always happy to see students there. Um, I'm at 344E. Um, and if you don't uh, want to do that, we can meet on Skype or FaceTime or whatever have you, okay? I thank you for your time. I hope you're finding the chapter well. But remember, read the chapter, try the homework problems, listen to the lecture, 
then go back, look at the problems again, and then see why you might have had a problem. Okay, thank you for your time.